I was asked to do this, I thought, who better to do this with than my friend Sarah Thornton, best known for seven days in the art world, but a writer for The Economist magazine. And just a quick brief on myself. Uh, for 46 years, I've been advising the development community here from Vancouver and in Canada, a little bit into, into the United States. And I think the real reason I was asked is I have a role of being uh, president of Tate Americas uh, from London, operating out of New York, and I'm a trustee at the Art Institute of Chicago. So let's go, Sarah. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, let's see, I know you principally as a collector because of my beat in the art world and on the art market. Um, but I hear that you've been described as uh, the city of Vancouver's unofficial city planner. Well, Tell me we, why is that? We sort of grab onto any accolades we can along the way, but I, I, I've been advising the residential development community, primarily concrete, for the last 46 years and have taken some responsibility for working on some of the major developments in the city, emerging uh, communities and challenged communities. Is the slide up now of Woodward's? Yes, yes, we have uh, the, the artist Stan Douglas um, and a work by him in the, the district of Woodward, is it? Yeah, so w Woodward's was uh, West Bank Developments and we were on the advisory team and the marketing team of it. And at the time it was the poorest postal code if you're in America, zip code in Europe, borough uh, in Canada and 250 social housing non-market units and just over 400 residential condominiums in, a, in an area that had a lot of challenges and had to be surgically implanted into it and the public realm is really important and Stan Douglas who's actually representing Canada and Venice this year uh, this was installed in about 2006 in, in in the public realm it's a controversial photo that Stan did of the Gastown riots which a very a, a regional area in Vancouver in in 1971. The chief of police at the time, Jim Chu, phoned and said, you have to stop Ian Gillespie, the developer, and Stan Douglas from doing this because you can't really see it online, but there's a, a horse, a, a policeman on a horse with a billy club about to strike somebody. And we're trying to end controversy and, of course, police violence. But the artist and the developer went, at, went, went ahead with it. And it's a, it's a magnificent piece. It's a must-see if you come to Vancouver. Let me, let's skip to the next question and the next slide. Um, you, you of all people are going to have an interesting answer to this question. What makes a thriving art city? You know, I think for, for, for all of us, and I understand this is being broadcast around, around the world, uh, if you arrive in Paris for the first time, you're going to the Louvre, you're going to the Musée d'Orsay, and you're seeing all the, the hits. The second slide that you put up is a, a show that's at the Sir John Soane Museum, uh, a massive carriage house in London that has been donated uh, back to the city by a professor and architect Sir John Soane. This is a show that's up right now of uh, Pablo Bronstein, who's a brilliant draftsman, architectural renderings, and phantasmical um, artist. And I think what happens is, you know, you, you go to London, you go to the, you should go to the Tate Modern, you go to the Tate Britain, you go to the British Museum, but either on your third day or your second trip, you're looking for more of a patina. You're off to the Rodin Museum in, in, in Paris, which is why the slide is up. You hear about the Sir John Soane Museum. You know, after COVID, we're registering. It's a little harder to get into. But you're looking for these livable, walkable, grab a coffee and see the, the softer infrastructure around these smaller venues. And we go on a sense of discovery. We can't do it all with blockbusters anymore. 
And so much of the blockbusters are seen online and we've absorbed a lot of it that we want to find that right cup of coffee, the smaller art galleries, the local clothing designers. And I really think it's the patina and those, those smaller, softer venues that we have to spend a lot of time on in our city planning and finding affordable rents for these venues to go into. I, I'm, I agree with you 100%, and I must say the Sir John Stone Museum in London is one of my favorite places in the whole world. Stone was not only a, a landmark architect of the 18th century, but he was a collector of curiosities, art, uh, you know, fake Roman ruins. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's such a overall experience, not just a kind of isolated individual objects on the wall kind of experience. If you see his collection of cornices and gargoyles that he used in his teachings, but the way they're installed in the home to become part of a living environment. So for everybody, we're plugging the Sir John Stone Museum. Uh, let's see. So a different question. What kind of city may, or what kind of city is best suited to host an international art fair? So, you know, our, our, our art fairs started out for, a, if you said an elite group, a focus group, a passionate group 15 years ago. And as art has become part of our daily conversation and an asset class, art, art fairs have bloomed. Um, I, in September, I went to the Armory's Art Fair. After COVID, I thought, let's just get out and rebuild relationships with people we haven't been able to hug for the last two years. We went to the Armory's in New York. I came home. We went to Art Basel in Switzerland. And I just got back from the Freeze Art Fair in London about 10 days ago. I didn't make it to FIAC in Paris. But each of those cities, as, as we talk about them, have their own branding you know if, if you look at basel switzerland it's sort of the mother load it's where every gallery in the world wants to be involved and it is really focused on art basel doesn't have the infrastructure that if we go to new york or you go to london to the art fair what you need is a support system that new york has of chelsea and commercial galleries and amazing restaurants and a lot more participation in the city than just the art fair the freeze art fair because london's a little more concentrated you go to regent park the galleries all put their best foot the best foot forward and you you're going there for the experience somebody told me years ago that what makes a resort city work if you look at Aspen or you look at Whistler Mountain here in Vancouver, uh, just outside of Vancouver, Canada, is you may spend eight hours a day at, on the mountain and you will sleep eight hours a day. But for eight to 10 hours, you have to have restaurants, entertainment, dog sledding, other to be year round mountain biking, etc. And I sort of look at it the same way with the art fair is you spend your six hours at an art fair, that fight for opening day that collectors tend to go through. And there's a big shift happening in that, but it's another conversation. But what are you going to do outside the art fair? And that's engagement with galleries. And just like we talked about the Sir John Stone Museum and that sense of discovery that we want to find in a city other than the big commercial venue. It's interesting. I think I have a quibble with you on that because my favorite art fair cities are a little bit smaller than New York and London so that they have that kind of reunion effect where you bump into people on the street. So although Basel, Switzerland is definitely deficient in um, having enough great restaurants and you know in a regular non-pandemic year it's like really hard to get into the hotels you want to get into uh but i do like the smallness of it because it has no commercial gallery sector but it has great museums and and it does have that like oh bumping into the Weirdly, you bump into people from your hometown in Basel that you haven't seen for over a year because well, of the we, creation of other, the world. You know, other than going out after COVID, 
we've sort of signed off that we're only doing Basel, Switzerland for that same intimacy reason, but to have the success and to have a mass appeal because of the cost of putting these on, you need the bodies, you need the airport, you need the infrastructure. But I do think that, you know, for those of you not in art world, what happens is now all of the art galleries send out exactly what they'll be showing at the fair about six weeks early to selected collectors and then to everybody about three three weeks early. So if you're focused and you know what you're looking for, is the art fair going to be as important? So that experience you're talking about in Basel is what I'm looking for in city building is that those intimacy and those communities that start to carry their own brands. But for financial success, you need infrastructure. Agreed. So we sort of agree. Well, we I think we agree. I actually do think we agree. We're like, you know, slicing blades of grass. Um, okay, so, you know, an art fair is a big kind of art show where dealers have booths and they bring the work. An art biennial uh, is a quite different uh, form of large-scale art show. There, the curators um, just kind of determine what art gets shown, and it tends to be in thematic hangs. And for the most part, uh, you know, well, anyway, not everything's on sale. If things are on sale, they're it, it's, it's it's less it's transactional and it's quieter. So. Uh, what would you say are the best characteristics of a city or town that um, works best for a Biennale? And of course, Venice is the oldest art Biennale. Uh, yeah, the kind and, of mother. And, and who doesn't want to get lost in Venice? We all do. We complain about direction, but we love it because Google Maps doesn't work in those covered environments. But I, I think the difference between an art fair where it's commerce and then you go to a biennale which is closer to the olympics there's commerce everywhere but looking at curatorial and the risk that a biennale takes of showing where we're going what is current what are artists looking at it's not as revisionist or as safe as as an art fair but, um, you know, a, 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 a Biennale definitely has the buy-in of the city. When you go to the Venice Biennale, the entire city, every museum, every access point, everybody is, aside from hotel rates, everybody is focused on the Biennale. When you go to Sharjah, which was just one, one, one slide back, it, 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 it is demonstrating what's happening in the region and demonstrating what's happening in the world. The Laura Favretto seven couples, which is seven different car wash, sets of car wash brushes, which we loan to the Sharjah uh, Biennale, and we're super prou proud of it, was a chance for an Italian artist, Laura Favretto, to be curated into the Sharjah Biennale. So nobody's going there for commerce, but they're going there for a sense of discovery. You may start to watch Laura's career, start to like it or dislike it, but it, it entered Laura into the art conversation with museums and curators. And this picture uh, aptly demonstrates how Biennales often uh, move right out of the museums, right out of uh, the Congress halls into the city and take over parks and other buildings. Kind of, and so the benefit of a Biennale is you kind of are able to look at your, your own town in a very different way. Yeah, and, and that engagement, you know, if, if we look at Vancouver, we had, we hosted the Winter Games in 2010. And we had the buy-in of not only 650,000 people in Vancouver, but the surrounding two and a half million. And there's just that, that pride and the chance to host the world. 
And that's what, if you look at Venice or you look at Sharjah or you look at Munster every four years, the reason the biennales are every four years is there's a huge cost and process. And as we start to look at the cost of insurance and the cost of shipping and our, our, our hesitation on moving around in the future, let's see if they move to triennials or what's really going to happen with the art fair or, or the biennales. Because yesterday is gone. It's not going to be the same. Next question. So what can a collector contribute to the urban landscape? Okay, this is I think, the reason that they asked us to do this, this talk. But that, that is the front of our building in Vancouver's uh, Chinatown, the entrance to our museum that's, that's open to the public. And what you see there is Martin Creed's 50, 50, where you take 50% of any given space and fill it with the work we own is with pink balloons. And it's easy to write it off as a nothing. But when you come through or you bring your children through or your grandmother through and you're walking through the balloons and you're participating with art, your inhibitions just go and you're now dealing with art. You can leave it and say how frivolous it is or it's not art. But, you know, for those of you that don't know Martin Creed, Martin Creed won the Turner Prize for a light bulb, fill the room just going off and on. How do you fill a room? In isolation, I often say that you can write off Martin Creed, but in accumulation, I think he's a very, very smart man. Agreed. And we have another image here, a Martin Creed installed uh, on the facade of the Rennie Museum. And so that, that's the sixth floor of our, our space. And it, and if you can't see it on screen, it's Martin Reed's work that says everything is going to be all right. And when we were given approval to permanently install, everything is going to be all right. The then, the then city planner in Vancouver said, how are you going to live with this? Because we installed it in about 2007, 2008 as America was going through its mortgage meltdown, the economy was an absolute crisis. And I said, well, would you rather me get Martin to make a work that says everything's not going to be all right? And he was referring to that, you know, we have the ability to open a museum, we have the ability to open to the public, and were we sort of pushing this in people's faces? And my son and I always argue that he says there's a plan B and I say, no, it's always just plan A modified and everything has to be all right because we have to deal with the hand that we're dealt. And it, 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 it's controversial, yet it causes conversation. On a real positive side, we get notes all the time of that it was inspirational to people that were maybe having a bump in the road or a challenge in their life. And recently we received a note that somebody had it tattooed onto their arm and they, they live by it. So if it causes one touch of change, uh, I'm, I'm a happy guy. Oh, I must say, I am glad to know, and it makes perfect sense to me that um, you don't believe in plan B, only plan A modified. <laughs> That's perfect. That's uh, like, you, I see that you live that. Oh, good job that. Sorry, go ahead. Um, let me, I'm going to actually skip over the next two slides and go straight to um, my next question. Although if we have time, perhaps we can always come back. I'm a huge fan of Rodney Graham, who I know you collect in depth, and also Ian Wallace, both terrific Vancouver artists who um, you support hugely. But I wanted to ask you, how would you describe your exhibition strategy? So our, our exhibition strategy ties in with our collecting strategy. And this is probably a good one to, to, to talk about um, with this is Carrie James Marshall from a couple of years ago that we installed. We only install works that we own in, in the collection. We tend to bring in a very tough work. Uh, we, we work a lot with uh, emerging artists. Um, we own trophies. We don't buy trophies. And um, you, you make them trophies. 
they may come they may become trophies and that allows us the ability to go help other artists but uh, carrie james marshall for those of you that don't know carrie james um, i think he's probably the greatest living black american uh, artist today but we don't want to just own a moment so we've spanned carrie james marshall from 1984 all the way up to 2017 and we're out because of pricing we it's not what we do but what what you see here is a room that i think is cohesive but the wake the black sailing ship in the middle of the room um, started out with 300 medallions there's now 1100 carrie james keeps adding to it but the 300 medallions started with the first 20 slaves that came to America. And that wake of intellect of doctors and lawyers and social workers and teachers that would not be here had it not been for ancestry to the first uh, 20 slaves. The painting behind is the garden party. But just while we've got this up, and I know we're going to all run out of time, but at breakfast a couple of years ago with Carrie James, I said that this piece is going to go on loan to the American Federation of Museums and travel to small venues throughout America for two to five years. And he said, shh, I want to talk. Um, and going back, Carrie James is the one who said to me in the 90s, if you go in a museum and you don't see a black figure in a painting, you think it doesn't belong, let's change that. And I thought, oh, on the social justice side of the collection, which is 50% of what we do, sure makes sense, went on this journey. But Carrie James said there's a black light photo of a large sailing ship and a black light photo of a small sailing ship. And there's 20 medallions that go across it, the first 20 slaves that came to America. But there's a 21st medallion. And that represents one of the slaves were pregnant. And Carrie James' wife Cheryl said, it was a very emotional moment for the three of us said and it's carrie james as a teenager <laughs> I, and I said okay do i call jack shaman your your dealer what do you want it it has to go together he said Shh. he said i'm giving it to you and i said no i said we, we don't accept gifts like that we just don't he said no we had a discussion before and you won i'm winning this one but these journeys with artists that commerce is involved but we're trying to put together a collection on social justice and our job with our venues open to the public we have 92 works out on loan to museums around the world right now is our job is to support artists and raise artists voices you've jumped to the next slide which is mona a tomb, which is our first show. Mona Tomb is a Palestinian artist. Um, we opened Mona purposely, we expand her career, that we didn't want the collection to be marginalized as Canadian. We didn't want it to take on any connotation. And this globe is often out on loan, but I've always referred to it with each continent in red neon, that when one of us have a problem, we all have a problem. We all think that we're isolated from the problems of the world and maybe COVID has teached us a huge lesson, but when something is wrong in Syria, something is wrong between Israel and Palestine, something is wrong in America, it affects all of us. And if you look at what America has been going through and the socializing of racism we all have a problem and it's just really stood out and i had dinner with mona in london and we and we talked about this piece a lot that it's it's really stood out as a real grounding piece that our exhibitions and our collecting nothing comes into the collection that doesn't speak to the collection but M mona hatoom's globe of the world with each continent outlined in neon is, these are the things we have to be talking about today. And this image is a great analogy for the way the Rennie Collection puts Vancouver on an international stage, uh, you know, brings Vancouver into art debates around the world and, you know, makes the city an international player. Um, 
So that's a left a hefty goal, but we're trying to raise Vancouver, British Columbia's, and Canada's voice participating in the world. I appreciate that. As a as a Canadian uh, who hasn't lived in Canada for a very long that's time, right. I yeah. appreciate that. Um, tell us then, um, why is it important to lend works? Um, uh, Vancouver is your primary urban stage. Um, why is it important for the Rennie Collection as a strategy to uh, gift and lend? Well, if, if, if we're going to participate and raise artists' voices, we can't marginalize it to a vanity project just in Vancouver. That's throwing myself under the bus. But the goal is that artists' voices are heard. And Sarah and I did an interview last year, and I came up with a saying that I would like to become the greatest lender in the world. Don't even know what it means. But um, also, you know, this is Brian Youngin's basketball court, 238 sewing machine tables that represent that child labor and the abuse that goes in into labor in second world countries, but made into a basketball court that idolizes who plays on those courts and the runners and the clothing that are made from these used sewing machines. To be honest, we never knew when we'd install it again. It showed at um, Triple Candy in Harlem once. We had it once, we gave it to the National Gallery of Canada and they, they installed it for a year. So that's raising the, the conversation that Brian Youngman wants to carry on and can't be in safer hands than our National Gallery because they are actually can be the greatest lender in Canada, making sure that smaller museums have access to works that they are the custodian of that they can afford to store. And now I've just thrown you into the universe of an entirely different artist, Eliza so Niesenbaum. Uh, Eliza Niesenbaum, and this is right. Eliza Niesenbaum's painting of frontline workers. So we're always trying to, to capture the conversation of today to see how it's read 25 years from now. And given frontline workers, and we already have Eliza in the collection, when I saw the work, I phoned, I wanted to acquire it. And they said, the Tate has it on hold, but has no money. And there's a second work that goes with this. And after some conversations, we thought, no, let's be responsible. A hospital in Liverpool coveted this painting. So I have promised it as a gift to the Tate. And the Tate, through conversations and documents and everything that goes on, it's going to hang in the hospital where these frontline workers were painted from in Liverpool for the next four years. So there's raising the artist's voice, but raising the conversation that the artist wants to see carry. I have the sister painting to it and a few other works that are sort of COVID related. Let's see 25 years from now, how these works are, are read. Are we living in COVID-12 or was this just an anomaly that we have to convince people to talk about? Thank you. Um, so you've mentioned that you're president of Team Americas um, and you are also, as it happens, on the board of the Art Institute of Chicago. How do you see these uh, positions in relation to your uh, passion for urban development and urban cultural enrichment? You know, I, I often ask myself why. <laughs> I, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're carrying voices and I can have engagement. Can I go on the board of Museum of Modern Art? No, I can't afford a million dollars a year to sit there. But, but how do we participate? And Jordan Castile, who is in our collection, um, is a mid-career, I don't want to say young, but a mid-career artist, did a portrait of Obama. Uh, the presidential portraits of Michelle Obama by Amy Sherald and Kahinda Wiley's painting of uh, President Barack Obama 
we're traveling to Chicago. They're opening on November 9th at LACMA in LA. And I saw the painting and I phoned and I said, where is it going? And Casey Kaplan, the artist gallerist said, it has to go to the museum. And I said, I'll buy it for the Art Institute of Chicago. And I mean, how appropriate. It's hometown. Barack Obama's hometown, the venue was starting there. And it, I like the ability to do this from Canada because back to Mona Hattoons, when one of us have a problem, we all have a problem. So we don't need to marginalize, we're just people on the planet. And then the next image I know you're going to go to because Sarah and I never rehearsed the conversation, but we did rehearse the images. I like a well-organized deck. Yeah, that- Wendy, you're sitting here on the floor praying it all goes okay. Um, this is Yinka Shinabari's American Library from 2018. It's 6,600 books done on this beautiful Dutch cloth. And then in gold embossing on the spine is the name of an immigrant to America. And some of them are famous and some of them are not. Most of them are not, but all immigrants to America. And I had lunch with Thelma Golden from the Studio Museum recently. And Thelma is overseeing the art that's going into the Obama Library. And I would like to see this leave our collection and go to the Obama Library, but I don't want to see it go into the basement. It would have to be installed somewhere permanently. That's a huge ask of myself on, on behalf of Yinka Shinabari and, and that system, but it, it, it should, it, we've never, we bought it in 2018, we've never had it home. It's been off to Cleveland. It's been off to Louisiana. Wendy would know the other places. It's, it's always traveling because it is a monumental statement and it should be in seen a lot more broadly than just here in Vancouver. So final slide, because I realize we're three minutes over, um, but I can't resist. Here you are next to a work well, next to Thomas Price and a work by Thomas Price? Yes, it's, it, th- this is uh, Thomas Price's cover up. I just want to get the year right. So in 2020, and we helped Thomas with the fabrication of it. Thomas was, didn't have a gallery, a, a British artist that is so steeped in art history. And if you get a chance to read on Thomas J. Price, his comments on monuments today are very, very balanced, but opinionated. And this went on loan to the power plant in Toronto, Canada. And I went out and met, met Tom there. And since we, we were in the corner of my family room is a 37 inch bronze by Tom. And Tom's a young artist that we decided that, that we liked what we were hearing and doing. And now Tom has been just signed up a few months ago with a wonderful gallery, Hauser and Wirth, um, out of Zurich and around the planet. And his career is off and going. So Tom remains a friend, but will be difficult to collect as the world seeks him. But this is the, the journey and he understands scale. And when we see that black figure in a hoodie, or we see that black figure holding, is that a cell phone in their pocket? The generalizations that have gone along with those figures throughout our life. And Tom is tackling and celebrating those issues, not the victim, just getting those, a nine foot sculpture, a 37 inch sculpture that occupies room, just holding those conversations. So, Our goal, you know, we're going over is to make sure that some of our collecting philosophies, they work for me. I have a thing with all collectors, find a lane and get in it. And after 10 years, then swerve all over the road. But, but we're trying to take some of our practice and make sure that it, it actually gets out to the world because it's what artists need. And they're going to need a lot more bobs coming out of COVID. I want to thank you so much, Bob, not only for this conversation, but for the way you uh, 
ha basically have an amazing eye for creativity and talent and also back it and back it in ways that really make a difference. Um, you know, as you said, you don't collect trophy by dead white men, uh, but diverse emergent artists. Yeah. It's, it's, it's when we were asked to do yeah. this, I just trust Sarah with our journey and thank you everybody for listening. As we're leaving, I just have to tell you what's behind me. It's from 1956 by Charles White. It is Carrie James Marshall's mentor, Charles White, but it is a drawing from 1956 that never left the collector's wall till about five years ago when we acquired it. But it was made into a poster in 1960 for the Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy walk in Los Angeles. And just that hands open, we're here to talk and not to fight. It's just, it, it's sort of what we want in the collection. So I felt I had to explain that. Thank you everybody for listening. Thank you. This is an honor. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Bob. I think we're off. Oh, God, I'm sweating. <laughs>